Thank you all for, for coming. So uh, I'll give you a little introduction to, to the work that I do. Uh, I'm a, a geographer originally, and um, I do a little bit of everything now. So a bit of physical geography, on the, on the climatology, on the water resources, and I also now work a lot with social scientists, and I'm interested in policy processes. So my role in a lot of a lot of my research tends to be acting as an intermediary across different disciplines and from academia into more applied um, ap applications of, of knowledge and, and, and research. So the presentation that I'm going to give today is cut, cuts across some of those things. It's, it's probably a little bit more on the technical side, but I want to try to highlight some applications. Uh, I, my work is very similar to Bastian's current work, or it was a long time ago. I, I was working on climatology, on water resources, and a lot of my work was in Africa, and that's very much what I'm going to talk to you about in, in the presentation today. And I will step back in time a little bit to, to talk about some early work that I did and just summarize some results of that. And then I'm going to jump forward to a very recent project that I was involved in, and I'll highlight some, uh, some results from that. But it's broadly around the topic of climate change and water security in, in Africa. And I'm, yeah, as I'm currently based in the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. But I was based at the University of East Anglia for a very long time before I went to, to LSE. So uh, I'm going to say a little bit about water security, what we mean by water security, and how water security may be evolving, our understanding of it in, in Africa. And then say, um, talk about water resources variability to make the point about what we're trying to, to deal with in, in terms of variability, in terms of change in the future. And then I shall move on to talking about applications, and I'm particularly interested in the linkage between water resources and hydropower. So I will say a bit about that and, and highlight some results from recent work that we've been doing on that topic in southern and eastern Africa. And then, um, and then I'll move on to the most recent work that I've been involved in, which was looking at the 2015-16 El Nino event and the hydrological effects of that, and then some of the so social and economic impacts of disruption that came with the El Nino event, uh, and particularly looking at electricity outages in Lusaka, and then I will wrap up with some conclusions. Okay, so I'm a geographer, so I like my conceptual diagrams of, of river basins, catchment systems. This one's from a book by Malin Falkenmark and Johan Rockstrom, and I like it because it captures the hydrological cycle, the physical parts of the system, and then the social parts, the different users of water within the basin, the need to manage and allocate water within a river basin. And um, it emphasizes that joint human and environmental component of water resources. And of course, that affects water security. So I've called the title Water Security, so I want to say a little bit about that, but I'm not going to talk too much uh, about it. I'm basically going to refer to the definition by David Gray and Claudia Sadoff from 2007, which is the availability of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods, ecosystems, and production, coupled with an acceptable level of water-related risks to people, environments, and econo economies. So it's got water quantity in it, security of supply. It's got water quality. We need to secure an, uh, water of, of an acceptable quality. And of course, it's got hazards. So it's got uh, an element of protecting or ensuring that people are not exposed to um, significant hazards in relation to um, floods and droughts. So those are the different dimensions of water security. That's what we need to be thinking about when we think about climate change. How is climate going to affect the different um, elements of, of water security? So very quickly then, with uh, anthropogenic climate change, we're expecting to see significant shifts in the hydrological cycle, and that's going to have implications for water resources on the land surface, the water that we, we supply to different users within river basin systems. So we've got changes in the inputs to the system, the precipitation, the rainfall characteristics, 
We've got changes to the outputs from the system in, in terms of evaporation, changes in temperature, changes in other atmospheric conditions are going to drive uh, alterations to the rates of, of evaporation. We can have secondary uh, effects on land cover. So as climate change occurs, we will see uh, a, a moderation or an evolution of the land surface characteristics. That, uh, again, will have knock-on effects for evaporation rates. And those changes to inputs and outputs from the basin will have implications for surface water flows, the, the timing, frequency of, uh, of uh, average flows, and then, of course, of uh, extreme events as well, floods, floods and droughts, and also affecting the rate of groundwater recharge. So that's what we're concerned about and what we're interested in in trying to understand a little bit better when we think about water security as a sort of as a societal objective in relation to climate change. We want to understand the way the system may change in the future and we want to understand what kind of uh, interventions we might be able to make to try to uh, resolve some of the, the negative implications of, of that change. So in relation to, to water security in Africa, I, I think it's interesting that our, our, we're seeing a shift, I think, a, 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 a change in our understanding of what some of the, the trends and the pressures and, and uh, challenges that we face are, are in relation to, to water security. So this, this shy slows diff shows difference different dimensions of water security that I think we, we often think of in relation to Africa. So on the left-hand side, we've got issues about water availability and, and the, the difficulty of accessing water availability through chronic water scarcity and uh, lack, of, lack of, of infrastructure to provide water. So that's a, a sort of the long-term situation. And then on the right-hand side, we've got issues around variability, particularly in relation to drought and the effects of drought on short-term water resources availability leading to agricultural drought or water resources drought. Um, and that's associated with food security um, issues and problems. Down here on the left-hand side, we've got rural access to water in relation to irrigation. And in the middle here, there is a, a GIS-type map of water security in Africa. That's something which is often picked up in the literature that many parts of Africa have quite low water resources availability, so measured by per capita water, then um, many parts of Africa have less than about 500 cubic meters per person, and that's argued um, to be w w an important um, challenge that the, the continent faces. So that's, I think, is what we often perceive or is, is widely talked about in relation to water security in Africa. But as Africa is urbanizing, I think we're seeing now a shift in the understanding of the kinds of problems that we face in relation to, to water security. So we're moving from very much what was a rural issue about water scarcity and extreme events, uh, droughts and food security, to something which has more of a focus around uh, the urban context. So urban flooding associated with high rainfall intensities uh, leading to very extreme disruption in cities. I'm going to talk about the link between water resources, river flows, and the generation of hydropower, which is very important in many parts of Africa. And then high profile has been the day zero and the, the drought in the Western Cape and the, the uh, pressures on availability of water to Cape Town. So urban water supply disruption very much featuring on the, uh, on the, the agenda now. So we're seeing a shift, and I will come back to the urban, uh, urban issues around water security uh, to, towards the end of my presentation. But before I, before I do that, I'm going to just focus, step back in time a little bit, and talk about climate and water resources variability. And here I want to make the point that we're already, uh, we're already ha we're, we have seen significant variability in, in the past, and that variability represents a, an important challenge to the management of water resources. So this is work that I did quite a while ago now with colleagues um, in, in France and West Africa 
and we were interested to put together databases on, on rainfall variability and river flow variability for different parts of Africa, West, East, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. And we spent a lot of time um, looking at the relationships between rainfall patterns and river flows. And I'm going to show you just a couple of examples for different parts of Africa to emphasize different aspects of the variability of the rainfall and the flow regimes. And these are very large river basins that we're looking at. They're all international, and they, so they're multiple countries. And I'm going to show the time series for locations which are downstream of, of these basins, which are, are large river basins, in most cases well over uh, 100,000 cubic kilometers. So it's a time series from the early 1900s up to the early 2000s. And the dark line here is the annual rainfall over that period of time. The rainfall averaged across the whole catchment area of the river basin. And then the turquoise or the light blue line here is the river flow over, over time, again, uh, annual amounts. And this is for a, a measurement site on the Niger River, draining parts of, of uh, the West African Sahel region. And the points that I want to, to highlight on that are, are that when we look over multiple years, the last century, we see that there is obviously there's year-to-year -year variability, dry years and wet years, but we also see that there is multi-year variability. So the two red lines here show the mean river flow for 1931 to 1960 and 1961 to 1990. So like a 30 year mean period that we often use to uh, understand the, the, the climate system or to describe the climate system. And we see there that there's quite a significant difference between the means over those two periods. And in fact, at the top of the slide, it says there's a 11% uh, reduction in rainfall between the two periods, uh, coupled with a 21% reduction in river flow over, over those two periods. So a very substantial shift in the quantity of water available over a prolonged period of time. We don't have uh, flow records for the recent past, but there has been some recovery in, in the rainfall and flows over that, that basin. Uh, but it just emphasizes the, the multi-year variability and the implications of that for management of water resources. So that's West Africa, and that pattern is typical of large parts of West Africa. If we look at other regions, like the Central and Southern Africa, we see quite different uh, patterns of, of behavior. So the top slide here is the Congo River, measured at Kinshasa, again over the same period, the early 1900s up to the early 2000s, um, rainfall and river flow. And the point to make about that is that it's much more stable over time than has been the case in West Africa. There's a period in there, is, this is the mid, uh, well, early to mid 1960s, when there was a, a, a series of quite wet years. But apart from that, the, the decadal variability has been quite, quite low and a fairly even flow regime over that period of time. If we look further south, this is the Zambezi measured at Victoria Falls, similar period. Then for many rivers in southern Africa, we see a much higher level of interannual variability. So um, in the rainfall records, we've got very high variations between years. But um, like Central Africa and unlike West Africa, there are no, uh, no major shifts in the long-term means in the rainfall and the river flows over, over that region. And then finally, if we, look, we move over to East Africa, this is the Blue Nile measured uh, just at the border between Sudan and Ethiopia. Same period again, rainfall, river flows. Uh, and here we see a, a regime which is a little bit more similar to West Africa with the, drug, with the shift between more humid conditions in the 1940s and 1950s and then a drop, a drop uh, with a, a reduction in rainfall and river, river flows. So and in fact, there was about a 6% reduction in rainfall with an 11% reduction in river flows between those two periods. So not as marked as in West Africa. And in fact, um, unlike in West Africa, there's been a much stronger recovery in the flows. I don't have recent flow data, but it has been quite humid over the, whole, the, the Ethiopian highlands that um, the Blue Nile drains. So um, we see different patterns of variability over time across the different regions 
in Africa that I've highlighted um, here. Overall, we can say that there are high levels of interannual, year-to-year, -year, and multi-year or decadal variability. We see that there are inter- and intra-regional differences for a whole set of factors, including climate, but also the hydrology in the systems uh, affect a little bit the, the response uh, in runoff to rainfall variability. And the river flows are dominated by large-scale rainfall variability. The influences of the Atlantic, Indian and Pacific Oceans, the drivers of that around Sahelian desiccation, so that drying out of the Sahel region, the El Nino Southern Oscillation has a very strong influence on rainfall and that, that um, plays through into river flows in Southern Africa and in East Africa, uh, an interaction between El Nino and, a, and a, something called the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is a circulation reversal in the Indian Ocean that brings quite significant effects on rainfall in East Africa. Overall, I think it's reasonable to say that there's no, uh, there's no um, general patterns emerging across the rainfall and, and river flow or water resources availability for the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, which is, which is unsurprising in a way, given the extremely large area that we're talking about and the very different influences on the climate uh, across the continent. But that variability represents a very significant challenge for management. And in, in some respects, it's, a, it's the kind of challenge that we, we're facing with climate change. How do we deal with significant fluctuations in, in variability and availability of water resources? And that's something that I've spent quite a lot of time on in trying to characterise that variability and think through what the implications are for the management of water resources. And one of the key areas I think, that, that's emerging in, in terms of our increasing understanding of the, the societal importance of this is around hydropower. So the next part of the presentation is some information about current risks to hydropower across East and Southern Africa. And then I'm going to say a little bit about the future as well in, in that. So hydropower, exposure to climate variability is already high and it's growing. So it's high because many sub-Saharan African countries are highly reliant on hydropower for a large proportion of their electricity supply. So here it shows for five countries, Zambia, Mozambique, four countries, Zambia, Mozambique, Sudan and Ethiopia, what their current installed hydropower capacity is and what it could end up as by the 2030s. And this is Ethiopia here with a, a shift from 3.7 gigawatts up to 19.5 gigawatts by 2030 if the, the current dams which are being um, planned, designed and built, if they're all completed, then uh, we could see almost 20 gigawatts of generating capacity in Ethiopia. And then on the right-hand side, this shows this is for five countries, Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Uganda. The proportion of their electricity that comes from hydropower now in 2015 and by the 2030s. And for all five of those countries, they will have round about or well, above 85% of their power coming from hydroelectricity. So it's a very high reliance on this source of energy and I'm going to make the point about the exposure of hydropower to variability and to, to uh, particularly droughts uh, leading to the potential for disruption to electricity generation. So we did some work where we were interested to, to try to just aggregate what the current plans are for, for new dams in eastern and southern Africa. There is a, a new phase of dam building in many parts of Africa through Ch particularly Chinese involvement and the freeing up of finance to build the, that new infrastructure. So we're seeing a, a bit of a renaissance there. In Eastern Africa, from the present, we're moving from about 10 gigawatts to 34 gigawatts, 27 new dams. Southern Africa, a bit less expansion, but from 7 to 15 gigawatts with 13 new dams. This is assuming that all those da the dams which are currently planned do get made. But uh, if that does go ahead, then those would be the relevant statistics. So we're seeing an expansion and an increasing reliance on this source of energy. However, 
if we look through the recent past, we can see that there are occasions where hydropower generation has been very significantly disrupted by the effects of rainfall variability and flow, uh, flow reductions leading to the reduction in hydropower generation. So there's some examples from the, the Kariba Dam in the Zambezi Basin in the early 1990s was affected by drought and it led to reduction in power and what's sometimes called load shedding or electricity outages in the area. Um, in Kenya in the early, uh, in, during 2000, Tanzania in the early 2000s had a couple of years where there was quite significant disruption to its hydropower generation associated with drought, but other factors also coming in, into play with, with that. But um, surprisingly, given the, the economic importance and the disruption that the, the, the supply uh, insecurity leads to, there's not a lot of documentation on these events. So the, the examples are often poorly documented and there's quite a weak evidence base and there's very little systematic, systematic attempt to understand the significance of the problem and the response. We were interested to try to characterise just how important the, these fluctuations and events had been for power generation. And to do that, we used the recent El Nino to, of 2015-2016 to do a case study to try to understand a bit better what the significance of the power outages were for economic activity and I will come to that in a, in a minute. Okay, so we're looking at hydropower, we're interested in the effects of rainfall variability, disrupting um, storage leading to a disruption to the, the power generation with obvious consequences for activities, particularly in, in urban areas that are served by the electricity grid. Um, so one of the things that we were interested to look at was this, was the idea of, well, some of the, the droughts that we've seen in southern Africa and parts of eastern Africa are spatially very large. So you have the potential to have disruption to power generation in multiple sites because they're all experiencing similar rainfall variability. And in a dry year, then, you may not just have one dam, but you might have two, three, four dams all affected by the same drought. So we were looking at spatial patterns in terms of rainfall variability to, to try to understand whether this was, whether this was a, a, an issue. These are satellite time series of reservoir levels for three reservoir, hydropower reservoirs in East and Southern Africa. This is Lake Kariba in the Zambezi Basin. This is the Mtera Reservoir in Tanzania. And this is Lake Malawi uh, in, in Malawi, uh, which generates the outflow from Lake Malawi, generates a lot of Malawi's hydropower. And the time series are from the early 1990s up to the to very recent date from satellite. And you can see here during the 2015 16 El Nino event, all three reservoirs experienced a decline in their levels. Now, that decline wasn't unprecedented, it was very large in the, in the Kariba reservoir, but uh, more modest in the Mtera and Lake Malawi, and if you go back through time, none of them were unprecedented in terms of their low levels. But we do see there is a concurrent, a coincidence of reduction in water uh, supply, which, and in each case there were implications for, for hydropower. So to look into that risk uh, in a bit more detail, we did some uh, analysis that I will now uh, explain to you. But the upshot of that analysis was that the hydropower plans, the plans for new dams, we argued increase the spatial interdependency in eastern and southern Africa and have implications for this risk of concurrent sites being affected or disrupted in terms of their electricity supply at the same time because they're experiencing droughts. So to do that, we basically we mapped out the locations of the current dams and the planned dams. So the current dams are in blue here, and we did our analysis primarily in eastern Africa and southern Africa, and the planned dams are in red. And the, these are all dams which are uh, the, uh, the, uh, the present day, the, the, the relevant ministries of, of, of energy and planning are proposing to, to go ahead with. But what we found, 
was that um, many of the new dams are concentrated in just two river basins. In eastern Africa, they're concentrated in the Nile Basin, particularly in the Blue Nile, which drains the Ethiopian highlands. And in southern Africa, they're all uh, located in the Zambezi Basin. Okay. So, uh, and in fact, uh, the statistics for this are that for the Nile Basin in Eastern Africa, about 82% of electric hydropower production will come from the Nile Basin. And for Southern Africa, 85% of the hydropower will be located in the Zambezi Basin. So we've got the danger of uh, concurrent events because the multiple dams are located in shared river systems. So then what we then did was, th these are the catchments, the physical drainage areas of the river basins. What we then wanted to do was to look at, well, how does that relate to the climatology in, in relation to patterns of rainfall variability? So we did a, a cluster analysis of the rainfall for both regions, East Africa and Southern Africa, and used the cluster analysis to identify zones of similar rainfall variability. And that's what's plotted here on the right-hand side. So for East Africa and Southern Africa, these broadly map out areas that share similar rainfall variability. So we're likely to get a drought at the same time in each of these zones. The zones are uncorrelated, but within them, the rainfall is, is quite highly correlated. Um, there's three in East Africa and seven in southern Africa. Southern Africa is a little bit more complex, but what we see is that in each of those zones we have a high, well, in, in, in each region one zone covers most of the hydropower dams. Okay, so in eastern Africa 70% of the hydropower generating capacity is located in one zone of similar rainfall variability. Okay, so we've got this issue about multiple sites being affected by droughts there. And in southern Africa, it's not quite so concentrated, but it's about 59% of the region's generating capacity is all within this turquoise zone here that has similar rainfall variability. So the danger there, of course, is that we get a drought across that zone that affects the power generation in, uh, the, in the region with significant implications across multiple sites leading to potentially uh, big effects on the hydropower. Okay, so that's a sort of spatial analysis for East and Southern Africa. And then we thought, well, well let's have a look. There are ideas to um, link up the, 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 the electricity grids for Southern Africa and East Africa. And in fact, fact, Southern Africa already has something called the SAP, the Southern African Power Pool, which is a grid interconnection across countries so that countries can potentially trade electricity uh, uh, um, during, well, uh, to optimize the, the economic uh, allocation and to trade their surpluses or buy in deficits, deficits when, uh, when they are experiencing them. So there's potential to buffer drought between regions using power pools. And we looked at this by saying this is the East Africa region and this is the Southern Africa region. So there is a power pool in Southern Africa. There's a nascent power pool in East Africa. So the idea is that the countries will begin to um, connect their electricity grids and be able to share trade power. Um, what happens though if Southern Africa experiences a major drought and there's a massive, there's a deficit in terms of electricity supply from hydropower. Um, what's the likelihood that Eastern Africa is also going to have a drought? Uh, um, or could it be, if, it's, if they're, they're not correlated, would there be potential for the two regions to buffer? So if, it's, if we're short in Southern Africa, would we be able to supply electricity from Eastern to to southern Africa. So to do that we looked at the correlations between the river flows in the two in the two regions southern and eastern Africa and we also looked at the Congo basin where there are plans to build larger dams than, than that are currently there and we know from my time series that the flow regime in central Africa is very stable. So could we if we connect up the electricity grids in those regions, would we, we be able to buffer using, um, using the Congo, Congo Basin? And these, you can't really see these from here. These are correlations between the different 
main rivers, the Zambezi, the Blue Nile and the White Nile and the Congo Basin, they're all shown here as time series of correlations. So how, how similar are the river flows between the different regions? And the point to note about these is that the correlations are actually pretty low in most cases. So what that means is that we're, there is um, it's no more likely that East Africa would have a drought when Southern Afri Africa has a, has a drought. So there could be potential to buffer across the two, the two regions or the three regions in, in fact, uh, with this idea of regional power pools. The, the power pools are very nascent at the moment, so the, it's, we, we're speculating about the potential for this to be implemented. Okay, so that's uh, a, a summary of the sort of large-scale analysis of, of hydropower in, in two regions. I then want to just run through the recent work that I mentioned at, at the beginning of the presentation that we've been doing looking at the effects of the 2015-2016 El Nino event. So um, there, was a, there was a call from NERC and the Department for International Development to look at um, while the event was happening, what were the, what were the impacts of the El Nino, um, what was being done in relation to anticipation and to respond to the, the effects of the of the extreme event. And we looked at three countries, Kenya, um, particularly in Nairobi, where we were interested in flooding events. So you, what tends to happen during an El Nino event in East Africa is you get higher than average rainfall. And then in Southern Africa, you tend to get lower than average rainfall. So we looked at two, two events. One was in, in Botswana and Cameroon, uh, public water supply disruption associated with the drought, so similar to what was, had been happening in Cape Town. And then in Lusaka, we looked at this interaction between drought and river, river flows, reservoir storage, and, and its effect on electricity supply. And that's the example that I'm going to talk to you about now to just look at the issues around load shedding during the drought associated with the El Nino event. I've not really got time to, to talk about the other, the other two events, but um, very much really going back to this idea about urban issues, then uh, in all three capital cities, there were very significant disruption associated with, with the uh, rainfall uh, anomalies that occurred during the, that El Nino event. So, Drought and load shedding in Zambia during the 2015-2016 El Nino. There are complex impact pathways. I've talked a lot about the hydrology and the water resources. In each of these, uh, the cases that I've talked about so far, of course, governance, the underlying governance structures, the way water is managed and allocated within society, and, the mani the, and then the management of the institutional capacity to deal with extreme events are important mediating effects. So we've got a biophysical hazard, we've got a drought, but the outcomes of that drought are very much determined by the ability of institutions, society, policy processes to be able to, to deal with, with it. And there are complex impact pathways. And in fact, all three examples that I mentioned on the previous slide, we found that there were uh, very, strong, uh, very strong effects from the management of, of the events that, that came into play. So this is the, the level of Lake Kariba uh, uh, in the Zambezi River Basin. And Kariba is one of two major hydropower dams in the Zambezi Basin and Kariba supplies a lot of the electricity to the capital of Zambia, Lusaka. So we have a proxy in, in relation to the storage of the lake, we can get uh, a, uh, an indication of the likely hydropower that can be generated from it. So we looked at the rainfall patterns, we looked at how that affected the river flows, and then we looked at how the river flows affected the storage of the lake to understand the hydrological impact pathway. And what we found from that was that actually the, um, the, 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 the climatology and the hydrology was not unprecedented. So we had had uh, similar dry years in the last 20 to 30 years, both in terms of rainfall and in terms of uh, river flows and in terms of the, the lake levels. So I think you can the red shade air, shaded area there 
is the level of, of Lake Kariba. And you can see going back in time with the, the late 1990s, there, were, well, there was an even lower level of the, the reservoir at that point. So not unprecedented. But in relation to the load shedding, the electricity supply disruption, that was unprecedented. So there was a sort of magnification of the significance of the event when we look at the social or economic consequences of it. And that's related to a change in the exposure of the system over time. So in the past, energy demand in, in um, Zambia, for in Lusaka, uh, was, hasn't been as high as it is now. It's experienced quite a significant increase over the last few years. That means there's less surplus in the system to be able to deal with a, a, a deficit that might occur through a reduction in, in the lake levels as occurred there. So what happened in 2015-16 was that even though the lake levels weren't, uh, had, uh, weren't unprecedentedly low, we did have um, very significant disruption to the hydropower, uh, the electricity supply. That was also implicated in some management changes in the reservoir system. So not just re related to the change in the demand, but also related to how the turbines were, were being managed at the time. So that electricity disruption that resulted from the shift in the lake levels produced significant economic impact. Oops. So there's a, a news article taken from one of the uh, online papers here for Zambia uh, where the headline is climate change hits hard in Zambia an African success story so Zambia over the last five or ten years has experienced quite rapid economic growth um, but during 2015-16 there was a major disruption to the hydropower or the electricity supply within the city. So in May 2015, water levels at Kariba Dam reached their lowest point in 20 years. Then there were management strategies that were implemented. Those were insufficient to avoid load shedding, by Z uh, uh, with particularly within Lusaka, the capital city. Zesco is the electricity utility. They cut supplies by about a third throughout the 18-month the period. And as a result of that, the Ministry of Finance reduced their projections in terms of GDP growth uh, for, for that year by 1.2%, which was in part related to the power rationing. So as part of our work, we did uh, surveys in, this, in the city, in Lusaka, with small and medium enterprises, businesses, to try to get from them an understanding of what was their level of awareness about the event before it occurred, what did they then do if, uh, in, in terms of anticipation of the drought event and then when the load shedding really kicked in, how were they affected by that? What was the type of disruption that they experienced and how long did that, that disruption last um, post-event? So we did a survey of 78 businesses in and around Lusaka and uh, looking at impacts of power supply disruption over the last 12 months, their awareness and then their coping strategies. What was interesting that we found for, for Zambia was that very much um, government authorities and, and communities had been anticipating agricultural drought in relation to the El Nino event. And there was a quote here from one of our key informants, nobody was sitting under the expectation that we were going to have a sudden gap in, in energy, which a respondent from the Ministry of Energy and Water said. So in the past, traditionally, El Nino has been associated with, with rural livelihoods, impacts on agricultural production, impacts on um, food security, whereas this event, that didn't happen to the, quite the same extent, but it was very much experienced in urban centres through load shedding. As part of our survey, we asked a whole uh, bunch of questions about the, the, the impact of the event, and the, the panel here on the right-hand side shows the average scores of challenges in the business environment reported by small and medium enterprises in Lusaka over that 15-month period during the El Nino event. And we've got different um, sources of, uh, of disruption or, or challenges that businesses face. Water supply disruption, electricity disruption, access to finance, flooding, corruption, etc., etc. And what we found during the El just after the El Nino event was coming out of that 
was that electricity supply disruption was equally uh, ranked first with uh, access to finance um, in, in our survey. So <coughs> that's a much higher ranking than we often see related to electricity supply disruption um, in uh, African cities. The kinds of impacts that were that uh, businesses were buying generators or renting them, staff were laid off temporarily or even in some cases there was permanent closure of businesses, there were very unequal impacts we often found, smaller businesses were more uh, directly affected by the event than larger businesses that had the, the wherewithal or the money to be able to uh, rent, rent uh, diesel generators and so on. There was broadly limited awareness of the problem in advance and um, the primary issues were identified as, as access to finance, which is a very common problem for small businesses, but that was ranked equally with the uh, electricity supply disruption. So overall, very significant economic impacts from this event, which has at its heart a uh, climate variability or an extreme event associated with an El Nino event, moderated by the management of the event as it, as it played out. Okay, so that pretty much brings me to the end of the, the examples that I wanted to show you. So just to wrap up with a few concluding comments then. Um, climate change and, and water security. I haven't said much about future climate change. I've really focused on the past variability and then recent extreme events. And I, I like to do that very often because we have quite high uncertainties about the way the future climate is going to evolve. A lot of uncertainty in many parts of Africa. And I think a focus on the recent past highlights some of the, the existing management challenges that, that are there that we should be thinking about and trying to address perhaps um, as part of thinking about the consequences of impacts of climate change in, in, in the future. So what, but what, what can we say about climate change? Well, in relation to water security, we've got this definition of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods, ecosystems and production. I suspect um, that as we move out to the 2050s, the next two, three, four decades, then it's really m combinations of multiple stressors, particularly development pathways and population growth and changes in demand for water from urbanisation, for example, which are critical in relation to the long-term availability or, or, or lack of availability of water resources. When we look at risks in relation to hazards, floods and droughts, then the climate change, the extreme events that we're experiencing now all have a component of human-induced climate change within them. So they're, they're, uh, an element of their frequency or their intensity has, has the, uh, already has the effects of the greenhouse gases that we've emitted so far and the global warming that we've experienced. So, um, over the shorter term, it's that experience of changing frequency, intensity of extreme events that are critically important in relation to a longer term climate change agenda. And then to wrap up uh, in terms of conclusions, so what can we say about water security and climate change? Well, we're already facing very high levels of variability that's likely to increase or even uh, in, uh, get, get worse in, in the future. Um, the emerging issues that I talked about at the beginning, very much I think this shift from a rural livelihoods, uh, food, food security in, uh, association with, with climate to more of an urban experience of uh, disruption. We've got the inter interdependencies across water and energy. I've talked a lot about those, but interdependencies of course with food systems and interdependencies across rural urban environments and within river basins that link the rural and the, and the urban. Hydropower, one of the implications of course is to, to try to strengthen water and energy linkages. In many of the examples we've looked at, the coordination across water and energy sectors is actually very low and there's quite good potential to try and improve that. We need to focus on an improved management. As I said, these uh, we've got biophysical hazards, but the, the mediation of those and the outcomes are very much tied into governance and management responses. And therefore, trying to improve the management of extreme events will be a critical uh, objective 
in the near term future. And then when it comes to longer term climate change, we might want to think about um, rather than just focusing on the recent variability to actually look forward to the future, take some scenarios or projections from climate models and begin to just test the performance of different infrastructure, different ways of allocating water in the, sort of the basins that we're talking about to see how well they perform under a range of different outcomes. And that's often uh, re uh, referred to as this idea of stress testing the um, performance of the, of the investments to a range of outcomes. Okay, thank you. All right, good.